First, before we get into it, for those who might not know, how briefly do you define AI? What are we talking about here? And Jordan, I want to start with you. Yeah, so AI is this buzzword that has kind of taken over the popular science side of things. Uh, when I think about really basic broad definitions of AI, I think about computer systems that replicate human intelligence. And so that can be anything from something really simple to something really, really complex. Mm. What do you want to add to that, Anastasia? I think she summarized it well. I was going to do it in two words, intelligent computers. So intelligent computation, and what that means is computers and algorithms that you develop that start to th um, mimic human thought. Mm. And if the words intelligent computers make you a little bit terrified, we're, we're about to get into that. We'll get into that in a second. But first, I want to hear how each of you came to work in data. Um, Anastasia, Tell us about the path that took you there, especially because it's still a career that not as many women as one might expect go into. That's correct. Um, so it started for me when I was a child being very interested in mathematics. So I was good at it, I enjoyed it, and I excelled in it. Um, I grew up in Beirut during the height of the Civil War. I was a teenager. And while we weren't going to school, I kind of shifted my interest from math to science, trying to understand um, incoming versus outgoing rockets, um, understanding a little bit, you know, if you count from the when, when the time something was outgoing, you can hear how far it went before it exploded. So oh. I got interested in physics through that. And then um, I had a little medical um, issue. You know, most people who have appendicitis, they go to the hospital and it's done, right? For me, it took a year for diagnosis. And during that period of time, I'd have bouts of um, abdominal pain. We'd go and get blood tests and see specialists and, and so on. And so during that time, I got more interested in the biology side of it. And I remember one of the people that was taking my blood handing me a book in microbiology because I was asking him so many questions. He wanted me to just... <laughs> um, and as I went to college and, uh, and so on, started combining the science with the computation, with the data, and the advent of the human genome projects just kind of pushed me all the way over to computational, making the best use of data. Mm. Jordan, what was your path? So I was a student athlete for most of middle school, high school, early college. I competed in figure skating, tennis, fencing, probably some other stuff that I'm forgetting, taekwondo. Uh, and because of that, I have destroyed all of the joints in my body. <laughs> so I was really interested in digging into the research behind how do you fix a bum knee from fencing and how do you fix the herniated disc that I have in my back that I got when I was 15. And that really led me to tissue engineering research, the work that I did at Cornell as an undergrad then led me to big data as something that I could use to help solve these types of problems. Uh, and that's how I ended up where I am now. You know, you just threw out the, the two words, big data, in a positive context, which is interesting because I think a, a lot of people are used to thinking of that as, you know, a somewhat terrifying prospect. So I, I kind of want to throw out to both of you, you know, what do you think are misperceptions of AI might be, or are we correctly understanding it? And Anastasia, maybe we'll start with you. I think there's a little bit of a doom and gloom. People focus on some of the challenges that we read about in the newspapers and don't focus on the positive. Um, if we were to think about, we unlock our phone every day, that's using AI because it recognizes your face. Um, Netflix or whatever your favorite um, movie um, um, place is, it, it, recommends movies for you, that's using AI. Um, when it comes to your financial uh, affairs, your healthcare, that's when we get a little bit more anxious and more nervous. But the way that we think about it um, um, at Pfizer actually is you always keep the human in the middle. So the computer isn't actually making the final decision the physician or the scientist is making the final decision. The computer is helping us sort through the vast amounts of data so that we can make the best informed decision. Jordan, you take a lot of questions from your audience on your YouTube channel, which I encourage you all to go um, down the rabbit hole of. It's really entertaining and I learned a lot about AI. Um, 
one of the questions that you took recently was, can AI tell if my cough is COVID? So can AI tell if my cough is COVID? Yes, it can. So the MIT Media Lab, as well as I think Pfizer, Dr. Christensen mentioned this in an earlier conversation, uh, has been doing a lot of really interesting work recording people's coughs and using algorithms to detect whether or not you have COVID, whether or not you might have a different respiratory virus, something like that. And ideally, that's something you can kind of use on a population level, not something that your doctor would necessarily make like a one-to-one -one decision with, but something that we can use to get a sense of how many people have COVID, what the prevalence is, things like that. So it's pretty cool. And that's, again, where your physician will make the ultimate decision, but they'll be more easily able to distinguish, does it sound like a COVID cough or not? Should we order a COVID test or a different test, an RSV test or something else, uh, to get the ultimate decision? Mm. Um, just staying with this for one second, another question that is on your YouTube channel. Can AI tell if students are cheating? Ooh, see, that's a complicated question. I did a whole video on this that ended up um, blowing up for reasons that have little to do with the content of the video and a lot to do with a lot of people searching how to cheat on automated proctoring tests <laughs> at the beginning of COVID. <laughs> um, so the, the short answer is not necessarily. Um, a lot of the signals that they're looking for are things that might be in your background or can the system recognize your face reliably or have you opened another tab and whether it be the, the deficits that we've seen in facial recognition systems when it relates to identifying people with darker skin tones, whether it be you may or may not have consistent internet access and so you might not have enough broadband speed to even use the technology in the first place um, whether it be the the system sees distractions in your home that just might be your little brother running around or a home that isn't necessarily as clean as the model has been designed to to identify I think also neurodivergence is a big issue there because a lot of the ticks that they're looking for are things that people who are neurodivergent just naturally do um, so there, there are things that they've correlated with cheating, but whether or not they're actually reliably able to do that, I think is very questionable. And I think that on the upside, a lot of these, the companies that made these systems originally made them to work without any teacher intervention. And over the last year or two, a lot of those companies in, in response to feedback from students and parents and school systems have incorporated the teacher into the process of deciding whether or not something represents cheating behaviors. But you brought up something that I think is interesting, which is that you know AI might have been doing a poor job of correctly identifying behavior coming from neurodivergent people, and that's parallel to something that you referenced earlier, which is AI's much discussed inability to correctly recognize the faces or as correctly recognize the faces of black people as Caucasian people. And, you know, I, I wonder, I mean, we're talking about how people have, a, you know, a, a sort of negative view of AI, but these are real challenges. How are we doing on trying to eradicate some of that bias? Yeah, I mean, I think there have been a lot of strides made. I think that there's been a lot of amazing work coming out of the AI fairness community in terms of publicly auto auditing like corporate algorithms, like the Microsoft facial recognition system is the one that tends to come up. Um, so I think we are making progress. I think that there's also kind of a more nebulous question of what does fair mean mm. and how do you ingrain that into an algorithm because at the end of the day, if an algorithm is representing the decisions made the decisions that people make based on the data we have, those decisions also have inherent biases to them that we may or may not realize in the process. And so there, there is a larger question of, you know, when you want an algorithm to be fair, like what does that actually mean in the first place? So what I would add to that is um, having the right guidelines for people to know what to do and what not to do. Mm -hmm. um, and for example, if we took the example of the vaccine, it would not have been developed in a year considering how long it normally takes to bring a vaccine or a drug to market. We were able to do that in under a year because we used AI at every step of the drug discovery and development process. So if you wanna think about a really positive way of using AI, that's the one that everybody can relate to. Uh, so there's a lot of positive, if we all use AI in the positive way, and same with 
anything else, any technology, light bulb, you know, going from a candle to a light bulb now to LEDs, we had challenges along the way and the humans helped resolve them and we improved things along the way. It's the same with AI. We're going to keep improving the technology and it's going to become safer and safer because we're going to put the right uh, safeguards in place, the right security in place. So um, people can't take a perfectly normal algorithm and use it for, um, for malicious intent. Mm. You know, we were talking earlier about just sort of representation of women and, and specifically also of women of color in the sciences and in AI. And some of the statistics are really still, you know, pretty dismal. Uh, less than 14% of authors of AI research papers are women. And if you look at STEM more broadly and you want to look specifically at women of color, only 4% of leadership roles in STEM are held by women of color. I know this issue is really important to both of you. Um, what do you think is the most important step forward that needs to happen that hasn't happened yet? I mean, given that we've gone through decades of hearing about, you know, girls who code, there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of programs trying to get more girls interested in STEM. What's like the thing that is needed to really create momentum? Can I give two things? Please. Because <laughs> I think there's two dimensions to this. There's the individual dimension. Don't hold back. Don't be scared, don't be afraid to try. So as an individual, go for it. If you think you're only qualified 50% of the way, go for it. So that's the first dimension. The second dimension is for anyone who um, is able to be an ally for women. Support women, support your daughters, your cousins, your nieces, your to try something new, to be ambitious, to give something a try and not be afraid of it because they don't 100% um, qualify. I know employers are doing that. So it goes beyond employers. It goes, becomes individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. I also, I don't know that I have one specific thing um, when it comes to addressing that issue. I think that obviously it's part of the larger pipeline problem, the larger leaky pipeline issue. But I also think that especially in the AI community over the last three or four years or so. Um, there have been a lot of people of color, women interested in getting involved in the field, which has been amazing. Um, but I think that when, when anyone gets involved in a field, you bring your lived experiences with that, and that often influences the type of research that you're interested in. And I think that the, the broader, especially academic AI community, hasn't necessarily been receptive to supporting those areas of research as much. Um, and so I would also just love to see, you know, more support around fairness work, more support around work that impacts LGBTQ plus people, more support around neurodivergent people um, who are interested in pursuing things that might not be like straight ML theory, but might be applications of AI towards other things that impact their communities. I want to get back to, for a last quick question, to that sense of joy that I know you both have in your work. We have a lot of folks in the audience who are young. I know there are high school students here, college students. Um, and, you know, of course, it's possible to shift into working in data, you know, even once you're already along in your career. Why should folks in this room consider doing what you do all day? because it's exciting and, be, and because it's gonna change the world. And I think it's gonna change the world in a positive way. Uh, and whatever your interest is, uh, it doesn't have to be in the sciences, uh, you can still apply AI. So we're applying AI in um, recruitment, for example. We apply it in many different areas. So be curious, ask the questions, don't limit yourself. Yeah, and I would say because it's fun. I have a lot of questions. I had questions about how to fix my body. I have questions about how to make sure that my face gets seen when an algorithm looks at me. I have questions about how to make sure that as a queer person, I don't end up in an uncomfortable situation because of algorithms. And I have questions that are outside of science. So for me, all of it comes back to, to answering questions that I have. And so if you have questions and AI fits into that, then you should definitely chase it. All right, you heard them, chase it. Thank you so much.